Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Michael Sandel, who famously teaches political philosophy at Harvard. Uh, his course, Justice, is the first Harvard course freely available online and on television, and it has been viewed by tens of millions of people around the world. Here, he's been a, a very distinguished wreath lecturer, and he's packed St. Paul's Cathedral, indeed packed every venue around the world where he appears. His books include What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? And the latest, as Daisy was saying, this book, The Tyranny of Merit, uh, What's Become of the Common Good, couldn't be more timely because we are looking across that chasm in both the United States and in UK society between the world of Trump supporters, or perhaps here we talk about Brexiters, and Joe Biden's Democrats who just squeaked to victory. This book is about the people that Hillary Clinton once called the deplorables, despised and rebellious. It's about the credentialed versus uh, those who have no college degree. It's about why social mobility is no answer, why raising some up by merit isn't a solution to fundamental growing uh, grotesque inequality. Biden, like Obama, is promising to uh, unify the country. Can he do any better? Can it be done? This book offers some good remedies uh, to restore the dignity of work of all kinds, work by hand and brain, uh, to respect skills of many sorts. I think in the pandemic particularly, this is a, a very good time to talk about this because we have seen here in Britain, and I think it's been true everywhere that the pandemic has touched, uh, we've had a ritual of standing out on our doorsteps and applauding others who are not locked up at home, but are out there, uh, whether that's medical staff, nurses, but also increasingly people came to be applauding those who were doing the hard work of caring, of shelf stacking in supermarkets, of the delivery drivers who were supplying those supermarkets. We began to see what really matters and it was not necessarily those of us sitting at home working at our laptops but those who were out there taking the risks themselves, which they did, which they have, which they still do, of contracting the virus. So what can we do now to stop that impulse, that impulse of respecting people uh, who do the things we really rely on in the real world from fading away? Uh, what can we do to end the tyranny of merit? Michael, I'm handing over to you. Well, thank you, Polly. Thank you so much for gracing us with this, uh, with your presence as chair at this event. It's a treat for me and an honor. And also for that pricey of the book, which I can scarcely improve upon. So let me just say that what prompted me to write the new book was trying to make sense of the events of 2016, the vote for Brexit in the UK, the vote for Trump in the US, and the rise of authoritarian populist figures and political parties in many places in Europe. What was this about? And more generally, what's gone wrong with our civic life? What explains the rancorous, polarized condition of our politics? The answer, and some may find it a provocative, counterintuitive answer, is that it has something to do with what I call the tyranny of merit. So let me try to explain. For decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, driving us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequality of recent years, but it's not only about inequality of income and wealth. 
It has also to do with changing attitudes toward success, toward winning and losing, that have accompanied the rising inequality. Those who've landed on top during this, these decades of globalization, those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and by implication, that those who fall short, those who struggle, must have no one to blame but themselves. Now, this way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive ideal, the meritocratic ideal, the idea that if chances are equal, or if they could be made equal, then the winners deserve their winnings. Now, of course, we don't realize that ideal fully. We are not a perfect meritocracy. Chances are not truly equal. And that's part of the problem that we face. But even if we could realize a perfect meritocracy, with truly equal opportunity, meritocracy would still have a dark side. And the dark side is that it is corrosive of the common good. It generates hubris among the winners and humiliation among those left behind. It, it invites, it tempts the successful to inhale rather too deeply of their success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And so it's perhaps no surprise that one of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the galling sense among, among many working people that elites are looking down on them. And this, it seems to me, is a legitimate complaint. Even as the market-driven globalization of recent decades brought deepening inequality, stagnant wages, job losses for many, governing elites, and this is true among center-left and center-right politicians and political parties alike, offered some bracing advice. They told us, and they told people who struggled, if you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to college. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. Now, this rhetoric of rising this faith in individual upward mobility through college as a solution to inequality contained an implicit insult to those who didn't rise. The insult is this. If you didn't go to college, and if you're struggling in the new economy, your failure is your fault. You didn't equip yourself to rise. This is, so it's no wonder that many working people would resent credentialed merit, meritocratic elites who explain to them the reason for their difficulties, for their struggles in the new economy, was that they hadn't gone off to get a university education. The fact is, and those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed, we can easily forget that most people don't have a, a, a university degree. Nearly two thirds of Americans don't, and the figure is similar in the UK. So it's folly to create an economy that makes dignified work and a decent life dependent on having a university diploma. So this is the diagnosis. Polly, what should we do about it? Perhaps we can get into that in, in the discussion. But broadly speaking, 
what I argue for in the book is a shift in the way is a, is a shift in the political project, especially the political project of center left parties who have been the primary casualties of the populist backlash. We should focus less, it seems to me, on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on making life better for most people, regardless of how well credentialed they may be, for people who make valuable contributions to the common good, to their society, through the work they do, the families they raise, and the communities they serve. And this would mean putting the dignity of work, not individual upward mobility, the dignity of work at the center of politics. Now, we will disagree across ideological differences and partisan differences. We will disagree about what it takes to realize the dignity of work in practice. But a debate about the dignity of work would better address, it seems to me, the legitimate grievances, resentment, even sense of humiliation suffered by those who have struggled under conditions of a market-driven global economy that the governing political parties and politicians promoted with the offer that the gains to the winners will be used to offset the loss to the losers. I would add one other thing, Polly, and that is quite apart from policy and political changes, I think we need to have a, a kind of moral turning. I think we need to reconsider our own meritocratic hubris because an appreciation, a keener appreciation of the role of luck in life can prompt a certain humility. And I think humility is in very short supply in our public life these days, especially in the precincts of the successful. An appreciation of the role of luck in success can make it easier to think of ourselves, to imagine ourselves in other people's shoes. There, but for the accident of birth, or the grace of God, or the luck of the draw, go I. So I think in addition to putting the dignity of work at the center of our politics, redirecting the terms of public discourse, we also need a shift in the harsh attitudes towards success that have driven us apart, Polly. That's a tremendous resume of your splendid book. You make a very powerful case that uh, merit is rarely earned, has all sorts of reasons why people rise to the top. But even if there is merit, that there is no reason for the grossly disproportionate rewards that it attracts, and whether that's a merit for a football player or whether it's a merit for somebody with uh, some splendid uh, Harvard degree. But this is still a very hard political message to put across. I mean, you say yourself that it's highly counterintuitive for many people. I think people feel that there is a need to believe that the world is a rational place, that there is a reason for why things are as they are. Mm -hmm. And the religious may have one view. Other people will say, well, it, you know, it's because people are uh, cleverer or smarter. Uh, how do you overcome this strong sense that, uh, the, you know, luck, it can't just be luck. It's unbearable to think that we are all subject to the throw of some dice somewhere. Right. There, there is, I think you're right, Polly, that there is a deep impulse to believe that the moral cosmos is ordered in such a way that people get what they deserve. And to read that hope, that faith, that aspiration into the way things are now. And this is connected, especially in market societies like ours, to the tendency to assume that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. 
But this is a, some, an assumption I think that we need to challenge and question and reflect on. On your point about luck, the role of luck, how, can, how would it be possible even to begin to persuade people to consider that success is not one's own doing? One might begin with a, a very concrete example. You mentioned footballers. Take Cristiano Ronaldo. He makes a tremendous amount of money. Now, he is very gifted as an athlete, and he trains and works very hard. And yet, are the talents, the athletic gifts, that enables Ronaldo to succeed and to reap such rewards as we shower upon great footballers. Are those gifts and talents his own doing, really? Or are they his good luck? And more than this, we could ask, what about the fact that Ronaldo lives in a society and at a time when people love football. Is that his own doing? Surely not. Surely that too is his good luck. If Ronaldo had lived back in the days of the Renaissance, they weren't as mad about football as we are. They cared more about fresco painters. So these are two sources of contingency that on reflection, I think most people would acknowledge, even those who lay great emphasis on work, on earning one's way up. So I think, I think we need to have a broader public debate, including a debate about attitudes and values, in order to make clear what on reflection most people I think would accept, which is, not only luck, but also a sense of indebtedness for one's success is, uh, is important to remember. And when we forget it, we create the deep divisions and the rancor and the resentment that we see all around us today. And that has upended democratic politics. Now you give universities a very hard time, particularly the Ivy League, but the universities in general, because they are the sorting hat. They are the ones, they are the deciders. Are you a sheep or are you a goat? You pass or you don't, you get in or you don't. And obviously the more Ivy League, the more prestigious the university, the more uh, acute those, those decisions are. Uh, the, who is going to be credentialed and who is not. Um, it's interesting that 59% of Republicans think that the net that universities' net effect is bad, which is uh, interesting. But nevertheless, if you look at society overall, education is precious. Uh, should we really be devaluing it? Uh, don't we want a population as educated as possible? Don't we want as many people to get as far as they can with their education? Isn't a highly educated population in general much better than a lower educated population for people's own self-fulfillment. Education is not just about getting your credential and your money. It's about opening windows into people's life, for people's lives, opening possibilities of every kind, not just about material success. Um, how do you, you know, how, how, how do you place education in your scheme of things if it's right. not going to be a sorting hat, but is still valuable? Yes. Well, the, my answer to the string of questions, rhetorical questions, perhaps, Polly, that you just offered is yes to all of the above. I would be the last person to deny uh, or, or to downplay the value, the precious value of university education, of higher education, or the importance of broadening access for those who can't afford it. I've spent my career in higher education, but it seems to me, and I am tough on universities in the book, not because I would devalue them, but because I think converting universities and higher education into sorting machines actually devalues 
the educational mission, the more intrinsic aspects with, that you were referring to, Polly, of education. And I see this happening and it worries me. There are two reasons to question casting higher education as the arbiter of opportunity in a meritocratic society. One is that when universities dispense the credentials and define the merit that a market society lavishes with rewards, it effectively excludes the majority of the population given the fact that most people don't get a university degree. Not only that, it tends to lead to a kind of credentialist prejudice where, and, and surveys have actually been done among university educated people in Britain, Europe, and the US who are less embarrassed about their prejudice against those with lesser educations than they are about other prejudices they may have, which I think is telling. I think it's telling. But, they, and, and I think it's worth noticing that we woefully underinvest in forms of learning on which the majority of our fellow citizens depend. Speaking in the US context, this would mean state colleges two-year community colleges and technical and vocational training schools. We woefully underinvest, certainly by comparison to a country such as Germany, which does quite a good job of investing in these other forms of learning. And we have a steep hierarchy of prestige, of social recognition and esteem that tracks that lack of investment. So I think that's part of what we have to reverse not in any way to diminish higher education, but to pay more attention, to make more investment, and to accord greater honor to other forms of learning that lead to careers that are enormously important to the, com uh, to the common good and to the economy, even though they may not require university degrees. So that's one problem with converting higher education into a kind of vast sorting machine. The other problem is that it's not good for higher education itself. Because by the time students from mostly well-off families uh, survive the adolescent years, going through a kind of stress-strewn meritocratic gauntlet of high pressure for achievement, often with helicopter parents hovering overhead. Even those who succeed in winning admission to these places often arrive wounded. The problem of the wounded winners, not only in terms of enormous stress, tendency to anxiety, depression, demand for performance, but so accustomed to competing, gathering credentials, jumping through hoops, that it's hard to step back and reflect on what path is worth following, what, what's worth caring about and why, what passions to pursue the intrinsic aspects of education, Polly, that you were referring to. So I think there are these two reasons to worry about the sorting machine role that we have assigned higher education. The tyranny of merit, here's another way of putting it, exerts its oppressive weight in two directions at once, on those it excludes, and also on the winners, it wounds and narrows in terms of the, uh, the exploratory uh, character of, of, of the liberal arts of what should go on in higher education. I love your idea that it should all be done by lottery. If you think of the kids you talk about who are, are going for tuition, for entry into preschool, top preschools, right. and you describe the pressure of their lives, it sounds appalling, it's bad, but it's plainly even worse in, in America. 
But um, how would Harvard take to the idea of saying, we'll just have a lottery. We'll just, anybody who's got the basic, the, the, the basics uh, to get in, we'll stop trying to pick winners. Right. Well, I do suggest, you, you've given away one of my more provocative proposals, Polly. I do suggest in the book what I call a lottery of the qualified. So it's not a purely random lottery. But here, here's how it would work. And forgive me, this is from the American setting. So you'll tell me whether or to what extent this could apply in the UK. But places like Harvard and Stanford get over 40,000 applicants each year for just under 2,000 places. And a large portion of those applicants, we're told by the admissions officers, are well qualified to do the work, to do it well, to flourish, to contribute to the education of their peers. My suggestion is we let the, that we call out those who are not well qualified. And then among the rest, the 15,000 or 20,000 or 25,000 who are left, who are well qualified, do a lottery. I have a hunch that the level of discussion in my classes would not be any less lively and engaged than it is now. But more than that, it would send a message about what is already the case about the role of luck in admission. And this, I think, could serve maybe indirectly, maybe over time, the moral education and the self-understanding of the students, the students who get in, the students who don't get in, and also equally important, the parents hovering overhead, that we make higher education less a certification of superior merit, which is extremely difficult in any case to assess or measure with this, among those who are extremely well qualified. Um, but more than anything else, to emphasize as, as one device to remind us, to remind all of us, but especially the winners of the role of luck in life. Do you, do you think that that's scandalous, Polly? No, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, uh, there was an idea that Oxford and Cambridge here should simply take the top two students from every single state school in the country. Uh, and, and that would be another kind of form of lottery, but at any rate, it would, it would ease the situation uh, a, a lot. I'm interested, of God's blessing, I once heard Norman Vincent Peale preaching, and um, it, it's part of that idea that it's unbearable to think that there is a great cosmic uh, thrower of the dice. It must, there must be a reason and a and a purpose to it. In in Britain, there's a there's a used to be a popular hymn which has the verse: "Rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. He made them high and lowly, each one in their estate." It was like kind of reassuring about that. I really want to know for you how how do we change the politics? How do we change the emotion of this? How do we Really, really esteem people do esteem to people that are currently lack it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, um, and I think Polly may be cutting out a bit. I had a little trouble with the audio, but I, I do think that I managed to hear the last of her questions, which is Isn't this quite a challenging thing to be able to shift attitudes? toward success, especially when there is something very appealing about believing that the moral universe is such that people get what they deserve and that those who land on top deserve to be there. And certainly there's a long tradition of those on top of developing various justifications for why they deserve to be there and why those who struggle deserve their place as well. In many ways, this belief goes back to the providentialist 
tradition. Debates in Christianity about whether salvation is something that we earn by living good lives and, and working for the greater glory of God, or whether salvation is an unearned gift of God over which we have no control. And in many ways, this debate about whether salvation is a pure gift or whether it's something that we earn through our own efforts and our own lives and our own faithfulness. This debate in a secular society is replicated in the debate about income and wealth, power and opportunity. Do the successful deserve all of the rewards that go with landing on top in a market society? Or is there a lot of luck and maybe grace involved? So it's true that the ideas about merit that predominate today do have a history. The most recent chapter in that history was when the word meritocracy was coined by Michael Young in the late 1950s in his book, The Rise of the Meritocracy. He saw that the class system in Britain was breaking down in the years after the Second World War, and he saw this as a good thing. But he also saw the dark side of, merit, of the meritocracy that was replacing the class-ridden society. And he glimpsed that the more it was the case that people could rise based on their talents, the greater would be the tendency of those who succeeded to believe they had earned it, and the greater the demoralizing thought for those who didn't rise, who could no longer say, not my doing, it was the accident of birth. And Michael Young, Michael Young coined the term meritocracy not as an ideal to aim at, but as a worry, as a dystopian scenario. And when Tony Blair began using meritocracy as the ideal that he was putting forth, Michael Young, late in life, wrote, a, uh, wrote an article in The Guardian trying to remind Tony Blair of the dark side, asking him not to project meritocracy as his vision of a just society, or at least to recognize the dark side. But Michael's, Michael Young's warnings were largely forgotten, not only in the UK, but also in the US during the 1990s, from Bill Clinton to George W. Bush to Barack Obama to Hillary Clinton. The rhetoric of rising. In America, you can rise as far as your talents and efforts will take you. This was the mainstay of political argument, of their political message. And but by 2016, the rhetoric of rising had lost its capacity to inspire. It by now uh, provoked anger, resentment, sense of humiliation among a great many working people. And this resentment, this anger was successfully tapped into, I think, by Donald Trump in 2016 and it contributed to his being elected president. And even now that Joe Biden has defeated Trump in the recent election, this basic pattern of white non-college educated workers voting for Trump persisted. In 2016, he got, Trump got 67% of voters, whites without a college degree, 67% in then, and in this election, 64%. So even though Joe Biden was the first Democratic nominee for president in 36 years without an Ivy League degree, 
And even though that enabled him to speak a little bit more easily to working people, and even to speak of the dignity of work, this divide in our politics, the educational divide, has not fundamentally been altered. Now, Polly, are you back with us or shall we turn I'm to back. I'm here. You're I, back. One of the things that really makes social democrats despair, uh, they're not doing well, as you suggested at the beginning, in a lot of places, um, maybe many will have taken heart from Joe Biden's victory, is that there is, uh, amongst those very people who most need help from the state, there is suspicion, suspicion of welfare, suspicion of tax credits, suspicion of the very instruments and implements that might improve their lot. Uh, the idea of subsidy, there is always the idea that somebody else is getting something for nothing. And as a result, they turn against the notions of the welfare state itself. And what could be done in America to try to repair that when it runs so deep? I mean, even Bill Clinton said, you know, we're going to break the bad habit of expecting something for nothing from the government, when even Bill Clinton could say that, it shows how much social Democrats feel they have to mimic these right-wing tropes mm -hmm. and have to themselves deny the importance and the power of the state to try and put right some of the things that you talk about. What can no. we do? Well, you're of course right, Polly, that this language, this rhetoric of individual responsibility for one's fate. And with it, the rhetoric of rising, the idea that the response to inequality consists in offering individual upward mobility through university. This set of responses, it's striking. One might think, well, this is the Reagan-Thatcher way of thinking, of insisting on strenuous individual responsibility for one's lot. But surprisingly, even when they passed from the political scene, they were replaced by center-left political parties and figures, Tony Blair in the UK, Bill Clinton in the United States, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, who moderated but didn't challenge the fundamental premise that markets and market mechanisms are the primary instruments for defining and achieving the public good. They, they soften the harsh edges of this basic faith and principle, but they never really challenged it. And what they did was to wed the faith in market mechanisms as sources of efficiency to a version of globalization that was heavily reliant on markets, including uh, where it led to the outsourcing or offshoring of jobs, even though it led to wage stagnation, even though it led to rising inequality. And then they offered a kind of moral justification and reformist project by saying, well, but you can rise. We have individual upward mobility. And it seemed inspiring because that offer of individual upward mobility was connected to the idea, a worthy idea, of removing barriers to success so that everyone in principle should be able to compete to clamor up the ladder of success. But when the rungs on the ladder are growing further and further apart, it's not enough to offer a political project that says we will remove barriers so that everyone can run the race and compete to climber up the rungs. That what seemed to be an inspiring alternative that did pay a certain, a certain uh, a deference to the free market conservatives who preceded them, it wound up actually turning many working people against center left parties because it was tied into this faith in technocratic merit, technocratic governance, reliance on experts, and offering those who struggled the chance to rise through individual upward mobility. And that's, so in order to revive social democratic politics, I think these parties need to rethink their mission and purpose and focus less 
on arming people to clamor up the ladder and more on a broader politics of the common good. And that means, and this is a hard thing to do politically, it means challenging the assumption that what counts as contributing something of value to the common good or to the economy is determined by the labor market. The labor market is a very poor measure of who's contributed what in terms of value to the economy. We, it's as if we have outsourced our moral judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to markets. And what we need to do is to reclaim that judgment for democratic citizens, for democratic political debate. It's hard because that people will say, do you mean we need to have political arguments about what roles really are essential? Who really does contribute most? Does it mean we second guess the judgment of the market that heaps enormous rewards, let's say on high frequency traders and much uh, more modest compensation to nurses, care workers, teachers? Well, that's, that's my suggestion, that this should be the stuff of democratic political argument that we should not rely uncritically on the market's verdict on what really counts as a contribution to the common good. But what it means is we have to debate the meaning of the common good. We can't outsource that debate and those judgments to markets, Polly. We, uh, in New Labour would never use the R word, redistribution, but what you're talking about would mean massive redistribution towards all of those people who pay us stagnated or fallen behind over the last many decades uh, in the process of revaluing low paid work. That's a huge political operation, absolutely essential to your project because there's no doubt that pay and esteem and dignity do go together. And to raise up pay is a part of the, pro the process. What do you feel about universal basic income? Is that one way to move towards that? It's non-stigmatizing, it's redistributing a lot of money, you tax it back from the rich. How do you feel about that as one answer towards trying to rebalance? I'm ambivalent, Polly, about the universal basic income for the following reason. I like the idea of providing basic income support for everyone. And I like the idea of decommodifying to some extent work, which is what the universal basic income does. On the other hand, it depends where the revenue for the universal, universal basic income comes from. If it comes by gutting social safety net and public services, which on some scenarios it would, then I don't think that's a good bargain. I'm also worried that much of the impulse and support for universal basic income comes from places like Silicon Valley, where uh, tech entrepreneurs tell us that we are designing AI machines and robots that will come for your jobs. And don't worry, we will pay you off. So please don't, don't protest too loudly. For some, in some quarters, not all, it is almost a way of buying off critical opposition or political opposition to the, uh, the direction of technology in displacing work. That makes me a little bit wary of it. But there's one other reason for hesitation, Polly, and that is, I don't think well, you mentioned redistribution, and there are two aspects of redistribution. One is of income and wealth. The other is of honor and esteem and dignity. And I think that to heal the polarization that afflicts us, we have to attend to both, including especially the second, the distribution of honor and esteem. And a universal basic income, if for many people, it provided an alternative to work, I would worry, because I think part of the anger and resentment among working people is that they don't feel that the society respects and honors and appreciates the contribution or the importance of the work they do. 
the fundamental human need, I think, is the need to be needed by one's fellow citizens and to be able to contribute to meeting those needs and to be recognized for it. And so if a universal basic income had the effect, essentially, of making work obsolete for a large swath of the population, I think it would cut, even if the income support were high enough, I think it would cut off too many people from being able to take pride in contributing in a meaningful way to the common good and being recognized for it. Now, perhaps we could find ways of according recognition to contributions to the common good, not mediated by the labor market so that we would honor those who raise families, raise children, care for children and the elderly, even in uncompensated family settings, for example. But that's, that's quite a challenge. So this is why I'm ambivalent. Do, do you share the ambivalence, Polly, or what, what do you think? I do. I do. I'm, I'm, I, I listen to both sides of the argument. And it seems to me possibly not the easiest way forward. It seems to me to have a lot of obstacles in the way that there are simpler ways of redistributing, I think, than that. The way I think it's very appealing in its generosity and its recognition of people just being alive and citizens right. and deserving whatever they're doing. Now, I think we better turn to some of the questions. Well, lots of questions have come up here. Here I, have, here I have a question, which I think puzzles a lot of people in Britain, and maybe puzzles a lot of people in America too. Alan Raynor asks, can you expand on Trump and his view of meritocracy and how he connects to the working class? I mean, to us, that's a mystery. This entitled uh, multimillionaire, how did he pull off this trick? Right. It was surprisingly, you may be surprised even to hear me say this, for all of his lies and prevarication, the one genuine thing, the one authentic thing about Donald Trump is his deep sense of grievance. He is perpetually aggrieved himself. He's always felt looked down upon in, in New York and Manhattan, looked down upon by financial elites and media elites and political elites and, and others. He's nursed grievances all of his life. And this enabled him to tap into the sense of grievance of working people, even though he's rich. And the, the anger against elites is really a resentment, if I'm right in my broad diagnosis, is a resentment against elites who derive their position and income and power from their credentialed status. It's an anger, especially against professional elites, credentialed elites, not business people necessarily. And so nobody confused Donald Trump with being a credentialed elite. They saw him and he took pride in being to the contrary. So paradoxically, Though he's rich, he, he has this deep sense of grievance, of being looked down upon, and he used that just intuitively to tap into the sense of grievance and rancor and anger and resentment of a great many people who have better reason than him to feel that. And that, I think, was the key to his political success. And it persists because even though Joe Biden has, has been elected, the question, the real question Democrats should be asking themselves or social Democrats broadly conceived is, all right, Biden won, but why after four disastrous years, including bungling a pandemic, after all we've been through, 47%, more than 47% of the country voted to give him another four years. And the question Democrats should be asking after Democrats breathe a sigh of relief is, what is it about us and what we have to offer and what we've been offering that still leaves so many people so aggrieved that they, they still want another go with Donald Trump? 
it's been a heartache for social democrats everywhere who feel they've devoted their lives to trying to do the right thing, to try to create the common good, to try to do good for those very people and to have them turn their backs has been extraordinarily painful, I think. Um, and you're right, it's going to take a total, utter rethink of attitude. Uh, you know, the deplorables remark should be engraved on every social exactly. democrat. So uh, you've, exactly. you've hit that one absolutely. Now, a lot of people are asking, I know we're getting towards the end, a lot of people are asking in various different ways for more of your solutions. Um, here's somebody, Jerome S, um, saying, um, what else would you recommend? What do you think of capping and flooring earnings, inheritance tax, investing in technical skills? You've mentioned that instead of university degrees. What else would you propose? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a monumental shift in our moral sensibility that you're suggesting right. and a huge political change. Two sorts of things I would propose, Polly. One of them has to do with something we haven't quite discussed yet, but I think it's very important. To begin to reconstruct class mixing institutions in everyday life, in neighborhoods and communities. Part of what's happened in the last four decades has been the separation, the segregation, the opting out by the affluent professional classes from the spaces, the common places and public spaces of democratic life that bring people together, even by inadvertence, as we go about our day. I'm thinking of community centers, cultural institutions, libraries, parks, recreational facilities, sports stadia, to say nothing of the, the public schools or the, the, the state schools. These traditionally have been institutions that bring people together from different walks of life, different class backgrounds across racial and ethnic differences that enable us to encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of our everyday life, and to come to sense that we share a, that we share a common life. So I think we need to rebuild the the infrastructure, the civic infrastructure of, a, of the common life of democracy, creating a broader equality of democratic condition, which is not the same as equality of, of result in terms of everyone having the same income and wealth, but a broad democratic equality of condition. That's one aspect of this project. The other, thinking more about tax policy and so on, is to propose at least to debate the kind of tax reforms that would not only redistribute income from the rich to the poor, though that would be a good thing, but that would also prompt this broader debate about what counts, what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. For example, should it be that earnings from labor are taxed at a higher rate than earnings from dividends and capital gains, and why? What are What is the theory about contribution to the common good that leads us to design our tax system that way? Here's one other example. And it, it, it's in the US setting, we, we have a payroll tax to fund social security, the retirement scheme. And it's paid by workers, half by workers, half by their employers, and it's capped. Why not propose swapping out the payroll tax, which is a tax on work, on labor, and make up the lost revenues with a financial transactions tax or a tax on speculative financial activity. Again, not only for the sake of redistributing income from the rich to the poor or to the, to the middle class, but for the sake of prompting a debate about the relative contributions, the respective contributions to the economy and to the common good of, say, high-speed trading or speculative finance that deals with derivatives far removed from the real economy by comparison with those who contribute valuable goods and services to the real economy. Having that debate would at least enable us to, to address to trespass upon questions about what really counts as a contribution to the common good that we have essentially consigned until now to market. So th these would be two kinds of proposals. Excellent proposals. I'm going to end up with a, a 
question from Anthony Cotton, who's saying, well, what are the incentives for politicians, for the elite, to change the current system of meritocracy, other than just altruism, uh, where they and their families are surely the beneficiaries? And after all, most of the time you are speaking to the elite, and my guess is that most of the people out there we, we can't see, alas, today, listening to this are themselves the elite. What is the, what is the selling point? to make the elite give up this remarkable power and wealth that it has acquired in the last few decades? Well, good question. I think I have an answer, but you will be the judge uh, in our audience, whether it's in any way persuasive. It goes back to my claim in the book that the tyranny of merit oppresses the winners and the losers alike. It not only bears down upon those who are excluded and who struggle for reasons that we've explored and that are self-evident, but it also takes a toll on the successful and especially on the pressures we find ourselves forced to impose on our kids if we are to replicate or enable them to replicate our success. The affluent and the successful have figured out a way how to pass their advantages on to their kids. In this way, we have, the meritocracy has become like a kind of aristocracy, but with this difference. The mechanism of transmission of privilege and advantage depends on subjecting our children to sometimes devastating pressures for achievement and for an instrumental stance toward learning that disfigures the education we're providing them. So that's one stake that the successful and the affluent in meritocratic, meritocratic society have in step, taking a step back. There's one other stake, one other incentive for the successful and the powerful to reconsider. And that has to do with the subtitle of the book, What's Become of the Common Good? I think everyone in our societies is troubled by the rancor and the polarization that has afflicted democratic life and social life in recent decades. I think nobody is proud of it. Nobody wants it to continue. And if my diagnosis has some plausibility, if one source of that deep division and polarization has to do with meritocratic attitudes towards success of the kind we've been discussing, then so far as we want to emerge from this rancorous condition towards something more generous, we need to consider a way of thinking about success and a way of distributing the rewards that our societies have to offer that draws on a more generous conception of the public good and of what we owe one another as citizens, Polly. That's what I would say to try to win over the successful and the powerful, as well as those who struggle. That's a, a wonderful answer, very inspiring. Uh, I will go away and do as you say. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. That was terrific. And can I just say to everybody, do go out, Buy this book, any good bookshop. It's a terrific read. It's full of uh, wonderful facts and anecdotes as well, uh, and extremely rich in moral exhortation of a kind that would do your soul good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Re really enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Polly. Thank you so much. <laughs>